to give this grand round. I I think it's a, it's a it's a true privilege and it's an unearned privilege. Um, I have to say, uh, to which I'm very grateful. Um, so I was asked to, to give this talk, and I don't know if I'm going to do this by sharing my screen first. Uh, okay, good. Um, I was asked by Dr. Uh, Coulter and Dr. Plana um, to present to you, and I was asking myself, what would be a good presentation to this elite group of cardiology fellows uh, in this um, outstanding group of faculties and an and, and institution like Texas Heart? And so I decided to just think around the work that I do, which I think I'm fairly good at, but I'm new at. Uh, I've been doing this for about 12 months. And um, that was a suggestion by my colleagues, Dr. Plana and Dr. Coulter. Um, and the initial thought was to talk about the cardiovascular service line. And I was thinking what it is that we do in the cardiovascular service line. And it, that got me to thinking about the talks I have on a regular basis now uh, around quality and around uh, stewardship and that got me to think from point number three to move my way up to point number one on the brief overview of the objective of this, this talk. Um, it is through the physicians um, and the physician dyads that we achieve quality and stewardship. And we do that because of point number one, that the world has changed since I was in training. Um, and now we are moving away from volume to value. So now I'm reversing the order and building up my case. Um, and I'm hoping at the end to give you a sales pitch for um, recruitment because I, I want to have the Texas Heart Fellows working for our organization. So I'll run by you our service line and the opportunities that we have and hopefully can entice you to work with us. Um, I have this, um, I have no disclosures. I, I do have a disclaimer. I'm, I'm not known to follow lecture notes and. Uh, follow slides, so I'll be talking. Uh, and uh, I had put a timer so that I stay on time. So forgive me again and table that under uh, an inex inexperienced lecturer. Um, so, so, so clearly the healthcare system is changing. Um, um, there is a significant struggle with the cost of care. Uh, there's staff staffing shortages. The technology is very expensive, especially in some of these highly technical fields like cardiovascular care. And that there is an ongoing demand from the payers and there's a lot of pressure to reduce cost and uh, uh, deliver effective and rational care in, in the management of patients. And the system is broken at many different levels. So unfortunately our approach has been over the last 20 years or so. Um, so early in the 2000s, there was a shift towards value or a focus on value. And I'm not so certain that we understood or that the people that pursued that understood the implications of their initiatives and or uh, strategies. Um, the payment models are definitely not supportive of a value-based uh, model of care delivery. Uh, there are significant redundancies in the way we deliver care. Um, the many attempts to improve quality, such as the enforcement of guidelines, uh, the pressure towards the use of electronic records, attacking uh, fraud and pursuing it. Yeah, it, it did cause some changes in behavior, but it's not necessarily meaningful, impactful uh, value for the patients and or the larger system. And I think this is a global problem. Um, the COVID-19, if it, it, it showed um, the, the obscene lack of collaboration between health systems, countries, significant failures in the ability to integrate and collaborate and or support each other. It was a very selfish, disintegrated approach at many different levels internationally and nationally and within states possibly and between health systems. It eventually brought us back to realize that we're influenced by what happens to each other and that this is a societal proposition and that we need to work together. Uh, it took some time to get there and now we're kind of back into that wavering position of how do you go about this and do we really need to do that? Um, so I went back to see what value meant um, and the basic definition of value um, beyond healthcare is the best achievable outcome at the lowest cost. Um, some of you and especially maybe your faculties who are interested in the business side of medicine are familiar with the work of uh, Professor Michael uh, Porter who is a Harvard strategy professor. At, at one point in time in his encounter with some uh, one of his relatives had a healthcare problem and he was in a hospital, recognized, he recognized that there are some major fundamental 
fractures in the way the healthcare industry approaches healthcare. And I say specifically industry because at the end of the day, this is a business of some sort uh, and how you approach it uh, should be in a way similar to any other businesses or business ventures. So he has some seminal papers out there that has influenced a lot of these um, uh, leaders in the healthcare system, especially on the government side. Um, but as you can see, I've highlighted the points. Um, he speaks of a very siloed system. Um, it is structured around supply of services. There is no particular continuum of care. There is no co concept of population health. And this is the last 20 years around that time is when he wrote his papers or got involved with healthcare as one of his academic ventures. And so, um, and it's hard to argue against that logic. It didn't come from physicians. It came from strategy people and industry people because this is truly really what was going on. We were building the case around supply of services, what physicians can do as opposed to what the patient actually needed and the long-term implication of what we do to the patients and to their family and to the society uh, at large. Um, that was a very painful proposition though, because shifting from volume and shifting from, in a, in a system that is based, based on fee for service uh, was, was a shift from volume uh, and profitability to, to value, which is a reduction in volume. Because if you're thinking prevention of procedural medicine and pre preventions of surgeries and prevention of using the hospital for care, uh, you're talking about reduction in profit. Um, and, and, and that approach was complicated. Um, and unfortunately, it, the decisions that will follow were based on very sound philosophical premises that we will all agree to, but rather very poorly thought of strategies of deployment. Um, so I think the value agenda was growing. Uh, the, the concept is let's pay for performance let's pay for quality, let's focus the care around the entire continuum of care, let's go beyond the acute episodes and let's go and focus on the patient and involve them in the decision around what we should do for them as opposed to approach them in an authoritative paternal pattern and say, hey, this is what you need to have and this is what should be done. And I have to say, I had practice in that arena and trained in that arena, or I'm sorry, era when we were, basically telling the patient, you, you have to have this because this is what needs to be done. Very limited conversation, very limited assessment of the other variables around the life of that patient, and very little concern about the cost of what we do. Um, everybody was concerned mostly about the survival of the patient during a procedure, and that remains a very important variable, obviously, but there wasn't a whole lot of uh, agony with patients' recurrence of uh, recurrent admissions or subsequent failures in, in other areas of the medical care that was missed, such as their cholesterol or diabetes or smoking or what have you. So Dr. Porter spoke of aligning competition around value um, and basically stated that value in healthcare is the health outcomes per dollar of cost expended. And that's a very logical position to have. Um, the problem is in the definition of what we mean in an outcome and the way we think about how we should reward those who outperform and should rectify the works of those who don't. Um, so as you see here, we will go through, uh, I'm, I'm gonna try to go through these fairly quickly. Um, what you see here is the, just a progression of some um, value-based and alternative pay payment models that Medicare and other payers got in, interested in in the early 2000s. And it escalated around March of uh, 2010 around the uh, Affordable Care Act. A lot of these programs are no longer in existence. It, was, uh, it failed uh, and it simply failed um, because it wasn't well thought of in my humble opinion. And, and we will go through some of the reasons for that. Um, but in 2004, Hospital Compare came about and it was about reporting the outcome of hospitals. The intent was to use peer pressure and, um, and you know, allow the consumer to pick based on who is performing better than the other and then choose the service or the, or the providers based on that. And initially it was around process of care. So it was, did you give aspirin post myocardial infarction? And then it moved eventually to clinical outcomes. Did you get readmitted with heart failure? Did you get uh, readmitted with an MI? What was the mortality rate? 
And this was publicly reported. And yeah, on the premise, this makes perfect sense. And the way this was handled was still around fee for service. There were some penalties if you didn't uh, perform well. This was followed uh, shortly thereafter with the hospital readmission reduction program where 3% of the reimbursement of hospitals were, were actually at risk in, in, in case of heart failure and myocardial infarction specifically. And along the same path came the value-based purchasing, which was deemed to be a, a, an effective program because it was basically budget neutral. So it was passed without any difficulties. The intent was to withhold money and move it around to the, outper to, to the hospital that outperformed others and basically indirectly penalized the others with cuts in payment. Um, to disrupt the fee-for-service, other alternative methodologies of payment were considered. Um, you know, account uh, accountable care organizations are basically integrated networks of hospitals and physicians. They were to assume risk for quality and cost, and in return, they would get rewarded or penalized. And similarly, the bundle payment uh, care improvement programs were intended to address specific episodes, usually, say, a myocardial infarction or a pneumonia, uh, follow the patient over a period of time and basically share back any profit that can come from a proper and effective care versus um, reduce the you know re reduce the payment to the to the hospital because the hospital went basically beyond what it was supposed to do. Um, the physician enterprise and physician practices were also affected by these programs. So there were physician quality reporting, value purchasing. Um, Two tracks for, for payment uh, were established after uh, under MACRA. Uh, one was the incentive payment program and the alternative payment programs. And, and this is basically, you know, for us, it was around the time when the electronic medical records has come about. So it was working around the meaningful use, the effectiveness of communicating with the patients, uh, the cost of care, and the data was collected. And in a way, you were forced to do that because if you couldn't report, you would be penalized. So I chose this word carefully, but I do believe a lot of these initiatives were performative initiatives. And there is a, a periodically a, um, some sort of a wave that comes in. I, I see now the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association and a lot, of, a lot of other societies pursuing now the social determinants of health and equity in healthcare. This has just become the new um, fad, I feel. Um, and around that time, 10, 15 years ago, the big thing was quality and value. Um, it seems that it's, it's always derived um, by people who are interested in, in the ideas and the philosophies. Um, resumes gets built, uh, startups get started and get bought. New programs are initiated and the people that were supposed to be served by these initiatives are exactly where they are 20 years later. Um, and in most of the time, actually these programs when we're reviewed, so we'll go back now to um, the value-based purchasing and quality improvement and alternative payment models. These programs had, based on the evidence, and I quoted here, um, peer-reviewed journals. So these are not some um, fringe assessment or some political hacks speaking about the government taking over control of the, the healthcare, but rather these are scientific papers that looked and saw that none of these measures or interventions had worked. And in fact, what we see, for instance, in the hospital reduction program, uh, an increase in the gaming of how you code. And I actually find myself repeatedly in this position. I'm, I, I do structural procedures and I'm always thinking, how do we code properly so that we're not penalized? And what that means, basically, we're, we're lowering the bar. We're thinking beyond what we were supposed to think about. That's how I see it anyways. It's like saying politicians are known to lie. That's just a normal thing and we laugh it off. We don't hold them to higher standards and we don't expect politicians to perform uh, as real leaders and representatives. Uh, well, similarly, now we're thinking of value as a gaming thing and we just have to know how to report properly and how to get around it as opposed to how to fix it. Because again, the measures and the initiatives weren't aligned properly. And I think um, the value of that is, was tremendous because millions and millions of dollars, if not billions, were spent to no, to no avail and no success. In fact, some of these programs were associated with increase in the mortality, and maybe that's not necessarily true, but 
at least this, this few papers that documented that patients were sent home early or were advised not to be admitted and pushed away from the hospital and end up dying more likely than, uh, and so there was no value to the patient, which was supposedly the center of, this, of these initiatives. Uh, furthermore, the, and it depends on how you approach this, some of these programs actually penalized the hospitals that were considered to be the safety net uh, for patients because their patients were more complicated. And now today we talk about the social determinants of health and the implications of having you know, no gas money to get to see your doctors or not being unable to afford certain medications or having no access to specialists. And, um, and, and these, these, these initial uh, quality improvement uh, initiatives did not take that into account. So the implications were your hospital is not performing well, your patients don't do well, your hemoglobin A1C is not on par, so you're going to get penalized. And what that did is basically destroyed actual smaller hospitals in rural areas, physicians who are actually fighting the good fight, attempting to improve the outcome of very complicated patients' population uh, to no benefit to the patient or the, to, to the system eventually. So now I'll stop talking about the value based and move now to point number two, which is the case that I'm trying to make, which is that we have to get involved now. The good news is a lot of these programs failed. The bad news is the logic behind these programs was actually sound and healthy, and we, we were supposed to pursue to improve the way we deliver healthcare. And I feel that, and I could be wrong, but I feel that the, the voice of the, and I use this word carefully, the working physician, so you, you can have an MD and an MBA and provide some um, suggestions about how you deliver care. But if you're not connected to the intricacies of how you practice in your hospitals, the shortages of in staffing, the complexity of electronic medical records, how we're doing the meaningful use of the and of these electronic medical, how are we achieving the continuum of uh, approaching that patient from hospital till the, the days that follows in, in, in the outpatient setting. Um, if you're not involved, your, your, your plans will come just like Dr. Porter's, very nonspecific, philosophical, we will all agree to it, but it's not practical or tangible. Uh, the motivation was cost reduction. It had nothing to do with the patient's well-being. And I'll make another important thing, the physicians and providers well-being. All it did is cause more burnouts. It pushed everybody to the brinks. It taught us how to use the electronic record by clicking in certain places to ensure that we talked about smoking and we did address the high blood pressure, even if we didn't, because it was performative at the end of the day. And what we did not understand, I guess, at that time, or those who came up with these, uh, these propositions did not understand is that there are more complicated variables around care delivery that goes beyond a certain number uh, of blood pressure, that is, or a certain medication, aspirin, post-myocardial infarction. There are limited resources. There is ongoing pressure and demands, um, and the patient complexity continues to increase, and the technology is not necessarily helping. It's just adding more, many more layers where we could do stuff, but I'm not so certain that it's impacting the long term of the patient. Um, think of TAVR, and this is a common question we always have. Patient is, you know, could be demented um, in a nursing facility, very limited quality of life, and yet an argument is being made, let's just do TAVR. A patient come in a cardiogenic shock, crashing 50 pressers, and somebody says, well, but the mitral valve is leaking, we can attempt a mitral clip, and the patient dies five days later. So, yeah, I mean, we're supposed to take care of patients, but we have to be thoughtful. We have to approach this as a team and we have to take into account, and this is not because the government wants us to do it or the payers, they clearly failed and their objectives were cost reduction, not patient care. So, so eventually the physicians have to say, this is for the patient care specifically, for the better patient outcome specifically, and it's driven by our stewardship of resources and our interest in providing a value to this patient. So with that in mind, I think um, I'll make a, uh, and I hope um, in the ground rounds, there might be non-cardiologists, but I'm obviously biased. I feel that the cardiovascular specialist is uniquely positioned to demonstrate and to lead um, uh, the, the value initiatives in any organization. We, we, we work in a very unusual dynamic. We're in hospitals and we're in offices. We're proceduralists and we collaborate with surgeons. 
we deal with patients in a very early stages. You know, you have those who deal with genetic abnormalities and cardiomyopathies, and we take the patient through that continuum from prevention to palliation. Uh, we're moving now from hospital to ambulatory to deliver services. We've led the, you know, a significant amount of technological revolutions, uh, especially people like you guys uh, coming out of one of these lead, leading institutions in, in healthcare and in science. Um, and, and these are uh, opportunities because A, it increases the patient longevity and gives them value, but it also has opportunities around supply chain, around cost savings. And, and I think the, the key here is that the cardiovascular physician is should get involved and should be influential in the future ventures. Because the good news, as I said, some of these attempted, although some of them are still operational, some of these quality uh, interventions by government and payers went away just because they couldn't do it right and it failed, but some of them are still operational and the reality of it is that this is this is something we have to contend with and deal with because the cost can, of, of healthcare and the implication of that to the to the national budget and, and, and to the survival of our systems, healthcare system. Um, so then from there, I, I'll move to the, I guess, how we would approach it as cardiovascular specialists if we were working doctors. And I think the dyad model of, of uh, leadership, so I've been in this post for 12 months now and, and I don't have a dyad leader. I've, I've had to make this case repeatedly to my boss and I think uh, sooner than later it will be um, approved. Um, I do think that this, this joint venture between working physicians and, and administrative dyad to anchor them to reality. So I, I tend to, to sh think about things that are sometimes to, in my mind as a physician should happen right away or why can't we do this or that? Or why don't we pursue this or that? But in most of the time, the administrative side of the operation knows um, the complexity and she and he can tell you, well, you know, we need to work around this, this particular part of the organization or around this particular law. Or, and I think that that yin and yang in, in, in collaboration is the key to success in leadership um, because they complement each other as leaders and they can speak to a specific common vision that can lead the organization in the right direction. Um, and this was actually something I found in the American College uh, Council for on Clinical Practice. It was white paper uh, arguing for the validity of this dyad leadership structure. I state that to you because I'm going to take you now to um, our common spirit cardiovascular service line and how we built this um, as an organization uh, using some of the concepts that I've just discussed, uh, our belief that value is important to our patients and that leadership should be physician driven um, or providers driven. And it should be in combination with our colleagues in the administrative side of, of medicine or and care delivery. So I'm sure most of you know this, but um, Common Spirit Health came about two to three years ago, uh, a non-for-profit organizations and Dignity Health and Catholic Health Initiative uh, came together. Um, they have one or two common goals. Um, they're, they're both uh, non-for-profit and, and they both share the vision of service. Um, they're faith-based and um, they are, however, completely different organizations. They don't look alike in, in many different ways. Uh, so this has been a very interesting journey for the organization and for those of us who are involved at the periphery in, in setting the strategy. Um, it is the largest, if, if not one of the largest, probably the largest cardiovascular operation today in the US. Uh, the numbers are staggering. Uh, we do about 11,000 uh, hearts, um, something in the vicinity of 40,000 plus PCIs. Uh, this is a year, obviously, 50,000 CRM procedures, uh, 3,000 TAVRs uh, this year, or earlier this year, uh, we, we, um, 2,500 left atrial appendage procedures, and these are booming programs, so we're, we're seeing an increase in the growth of, of these opportunities um, and these uh, growth opportunities within the system. We are scattered across a very wide um, and a large uh, footprint of 22 states. Um, we have very complicated data, they're not necessarily united, although we're working in that direction. Uh, medical groups of academics and non-academics, uh, community-based, independents, um, frenemies, people that work in our facilities and work elsewhere. Uh, so we have, we have a very complicated medical group as well, um, just to add to the difficulties that we have. That said, 
um, to put the service line together, we needed an organizational commitment to a service line concept. We needed an organizational commitment to the dyad structure. So the, the understanding I had when I interviewed for this post is that, yes, the physician's voice will be heard. I maintain a very active clinical practice intentionally um, because I feel that this will remove any pressure on me to do something I feel would not be appropriate for us as physicians. Um, and it gives me the ability to say, um, if, if this is not going to happen, I am not gonna be able to sell it to my colleagues. And if I'm not gonna be able to sell it to my colleagues, I think I'm gonna have to walk and go back to my practice. Um, I think that's important in the structure of leadership. Um, and along the same path, I think the only leadership model that works is a servant leadership. So it's, it's built in that we have to work with accountability to our colleagues. Our job, my job, as I see it, is to mediate, to facilitate, to, to, to align uh, around what we think is meaningful to us as physicians and, and providers within the CV space. Um, and value is very important to us. Um, I think we, we spend a lot of time talking and we kind of divided uh, around metrics of quality and our metrics of financial stewardship. But um, in, in the grand scheme of things, this is as we go back and look at the value definition. Um, and that is really what it is uh, gonna come down to quality and, and uh, reduction in cost. So the dyad model is, is the structure I spoke of. As I said, I tend to kind of drift off the slides, but uh, uh, this is now seen at many different levels. So in Texas, I, I think of Dr. Juan Carlos Plana and uh, Don Thompson as my counterpart dyads in the Texas division. I speak to them about their, um, you know, their needs and challenges, and I communicate with them our needs and challenges to learn from them. And if you see point number three, which I don't want to miss, um, I think philosophically, I we all believe, and I think that's logical that. We rely on local successes and expertise to improve the national experience. Uh, we don't come from the top saying, this is how it should be done. We, we come to Texas and say, how do you do it here? And why is it not similarly done in say in Nebraska? And we learn from that experience and go back and forth. That's how I see the service line should work uh, working. And uh, I think it's been so far successful um, for, for our colleagues and uh, for our organization. So we have that diet model across the board. Uh, we, we encourage it in facilities as well, uh, a physician and a counterpart administrative leader. This is the structure of the of this service line. Um, we have a, a governing body called uh, the executive team. It's representatives of, uh, so Dr. Plana and Dawn are for instance, out of our Texas division. There we have all the divisions represented there. That's the governing board that I put together last year um, and I go there to, to ask for guidance and direction and to argue some of my ideas so that we have a divisional representation and clarity that we can do whatever it is that we're trying to do. From there, you go down to the senior leadership team. And um, this is basically every facility and its representative dyads. And as you can see in the very bottom, um, we have various, we, we divided councils into basically a cardiac surgery council, electrophysiology, anesthesia, vascular, structural, uh, cardiac intervention, and heart failure. I'm, I'm hopeful to start a new one called cardiology because I think that we need to have a general cardiology slash imaging council. Um, along the same path, we put together um, a governing uh, body to oversee all the structural programs that we have at Common Spirit, and I'll speak to their role in a second. And my biggest hope uh, is to develop a research institute to utilize the um, huge amount of data that we have uh, coming from um, throughout the 22 states, coming from academic institutions, from small hospitals, rural hospitals. We have a unique um, cohort of patients and physicians uh, we have a unique experience that can be, number one, the best U.S. experience for any new technology to validate any study or research that was done in an academic institution, say. And more importantly, actually, to influence some of these metrics that we've talked about, the social determinants of health, the equity in healthcare, uh, how do you improve quality and value? Well, if, if there is any place that we should do that, it should be coming out of an organization of this size. And that's a call for action for all of my colleagues, uh, especially those with interest in research. 
we have to start utilizing this data. We have to weaponize it to improve the outcome of patients and to influence decisions across the board in other healthcare organization and in government and with payers. Um, and to that end, I think um, the Research Institute is the next step in that direction. So now I'll speak a little bit and very briefly about how we improve quality and how we influence supply chain and um, a financial um, or rational utilization of resources. Um, so we pursued, we use data, um, and some of you may have been very involved with this. I know Dr. Perrin leads our cardiology clinical council, so he's very involved. Dr. Chung leads our vascular um, uh, council, and obviously Dr. Plana and Don Thompson are very involved with the, with the executive team. But we use the data to influence behavior. Um, this is not something that I've invented. It's actually something I've inherited from my colleagues and in CHI, uh, my predecessor was uh, Dr. Jerry Granado, who had put this together. And I, I have taken the role after him and, and took it back to the larger group now with dignity being part of common spirit. Uh, using the data has been very influential. Um, the data is used as an opportunity to find ways to improve outcome, not to um, humiliate anybody or to pressure anybody, but rather to say, we do better than, we, we can do better than this. And, and if people can do it this way, we probably could do as well what they've done. And then trying to understand what are the challenges and how do we go about it? We do it very bluntly. The data is shared. Um, it's national benchmarks. It's coming out of registries that we all agree to. We understand prehand what are the limitations of these registries. And we can argue that, but in most of the time, this has been very effective uh, in, in awarding those who outperform the others. And this, this um, recognition of top performers had come with some valid and useful um, or gains, I would say. Um, for instance, our centers of excellence, which is a designation we give to those who outperform others, are the ones that test technology for us. We were the first to drop the, met, um, the um, Boston Scientific Tavern valve before it was pulled off the market. This is how we've learned from the top performers and we've improved the outcome of, uh, of others. Um, and the designation is based on the work of physicians. So I don't sit down and write these things. I actually go to the, uh, the leaders, say Dr. Silva and say, hey, um, I need your you know, input in this particular committee. We're trying to look at TAVR centers of excellence. We have basic requirements to enter. At the very bottom, you see these measures are necessary and it's related to one is volume, which is based on the national coverage determination. There is a specific volume you have to meet. Then from there, you go to in-hospital mortality, a metric that the physicians have chosen. You need to at least meet the basic requirements to enter to be a top performer there. And then from there, we decide what are the quality metrics that we look at. Um, at one point in time, it used to be ICU length of stay. We removed that because nobody goes to ICU now. We keep moving the and pushing the, the dial on the uh, quality metrics and the stewardship metric to improve the outcome. And then every year we refine these data and every year we're ambushed by how many people can meet the criteria and we have to tighten that and we keep pushing it to improve quality. Uh, the physicians play a major role here and they decide um, what metrics and how do we achieve it. So this is basically the structure of this. Um, since I've been mentioning Dr. Plana a lot, you, you might think that he, he had bribed me to do so, but actually Dr. Plana has been very influential in a lot of these activities. So I'm, I'm gonna mention him again. He was one of the founders of the Structural Heart Clinical Council that initially used to be called the TAVR uh, Council. And it oversaw just basically the TAVR programs. And, and we moved it now to oversee all of our structural programs. Um, Applications are usually also uh, looked at for any new programs and every program irrespective whether they're top performers or average performers are reviewed. We review them based on, again, the NCD, for instance, I'm choosing TAVR here as an example, um, TVT registry and the NCDR TVT registry. And, and these metrics are refined, as I said, but in most of the time, it's very basic expectations of performance. And if someone, falls behind, we usually expect them to give us some sort of an action plan to go and understand the root causes of their failure, be it an increase in mortality or a stroke or what have you, and come up with a, a reasonable proposition for us to say, hey, this is what we're doing, this is our action plan, and, and that would allow us to continue to pursue that. 
uh, program and follow them and see if their quality improves. Um, and a lot of these uh, domains are have been demonstrated repeatedly that we're actually um, able to influence behavior just by sharing the data with the physicians and by maintaining some mild peer pressure towards improving outcomes. So you see here, this is a composite endpoint to the right um, that combines a lot of the meaningful TAVR specific. And again, I'm using TAVR as just an example, uh, TAVR specific um, um, complications and or um, uh, obviously mortality. And you see that we've altered the, the course. We've had some fluctuation, but we're shifting in the right direction now. This is for the larger cohort. And we share with every program their, their data with everybody else. So you can see everybody's data there in mortality and in, in volume, uh, in moderate sedation. In, and it, there is a definite impact from sharing that data. It, it, the meetings are usually conducted uh, right now in Zoom. Um, every physician is looking and seeing their program. They go back and some of them will ask, how did you guys get around this problem? We seem to have an issue with stroke. And this conversation usually leads to what we call the shared learning experience where people start teaching each other. And, and occasionally would lead to some protocol development. And we learn from other programs that they've institutionalized some, some sort of a process that they can use in their in, in, in other facilities and we can replicate the same uh, uh, experience. Um, so I feel that the key point for our success in the CV service line around quality is that we've actually dependent, dependent completely on the physician's input. Um, our objective is to develop protocols and guidelines that sometimes um, have been very helpful when we share them. Um, in improving the quality in other programs. We recognize excellence and we had moved this objective for the last five years. And now we're looking at actually this year at um, addition to TAVR, isolated cabbage tier, um, the appendage occluder procedure, mitral valve repair, um, surgery and PCI. Now we're looking at aortic valve surgery as well. So we continue to push this envelope and the hope would be in my mind that one day we will have centers of excellence of cardiovascular care. So if you met say out of six or seven procedures, you met say five of those uh, and as a top performers, then we recognize you as the hub, the center for our research, for our technology evaluation, for our leadership across the board for the national organization. That would be the source uh, for, for talent is a center that is known for that. And obviously we advertise for that and this is a good marketing tool to some extent. So I think I made it towards the end successfully. Um, this is my last slide. Um, I, I ask myself every day what it is that we should do better. Um, I, I do wanna move away from, we still have a lot of work to do around operational efficiency. Um, but I do want to move away from that towards what represents us as a brand. What is our competitive advantage? Uh, I spoke about research. I think that's a unique, um, I know it's not, not common for community-based hospitals and the majority of our hospitals are community-based. Um, to think of research as a tool, but I do think that's something unique to us. Uh, we can, um, and I think you understand that piece more than others. Um, this will be one of the potential um, pillars of our competitive advantage. Um, the other piece being our involvement with the most vulnerable of patients being non-for-profit. So we have the advantage of uh, that has been recognized by a lot of the industries and other uh, by government agencies that we would be the ones who would, should influence policies. And so I see advocacy as our next move as well and getting involved with population health. Um, I'd like to move away from being a recruitment center. This is one thing I see. I'm not a researcher or a scientist, but all I see in common spirit research is we started the clinical trial under the leadership of so-and-so and, -so and we, recruit, we recruited 800 patients. Um, uh, I wanna see podium level research, as I say. I wanna see my common spirit colleagues doing what you guys do at Texas Heart. And I wanna see the Texas Heart Group lead that and even have a larger audience by saying, we don't just give you the Texas experience, we give the US experience. We led this research and had other institution tag along. Um, and obviously there are other areas that are related to our operational efficiency, such as improving the way we deliver care and maybe moving from hospital to the ambulatory space. Um, that's a complicated conversation, obviously, because we're a hospital system, but I do think it's, um, 
the, as I said, the um, change is coming and we just have to get with it. Um, that's the way the world is going to go. And I suspect we will be moving in that direction strategically in the CV service line and along the various uh, disciplines of CV.